It is quite peculiar, the happenings I've been made to witness for my supernatural longevity. I am thinking of one unfortunate phenomenon in particular, of unique interest to my station, both as a professional and as a sufferer of this vampiric condition. It seems the stream of time has begun to erode the moorings of my chosen course of study, for the methodologies that gave birth to psychology are slowly disappearing. I find myself in an era that overlooks the physical component of psychological pathology time and again in favor of the sophistic practices of Freud. Phrenology, dactopintalism, and the rest of the old guard has fallen by the wayside, its champions all silenced in death, with my unique exception. Would that I could make my voice heard again, although it may be suspicious should I return to popular medical discourse fifty years after my apparent death. No, better that I continue my studies into the psychoses in secret. One day, may I hold up my own cure as validation of the methods. I am confident no cure for my condition or that of my beloved wife lies within our figurative minds waiting to be unlocked by the correct combination of memories recovered from our childhoods. And I'm most certain it has nothing to do with the relationship between myself, my parents, and my genitals. Sorry, Sigmund, but I choose to stay my course. In time, too, may your star fade and disappear. Another unfortunate casualty to tide of time, insane asylums. 
I lament their loss, not only as brokerage houses for the breadth and depth of human psychosis, but also I shall mourn the disappearance of that peculiar... peculiar environment. present only in an insane asylum. That palpable atmosphere of blistered brains and churning bowels, the odiferous melange of freely flowing bodily humors, that gently rolling cacophony of distant sobs and screams, the muttered cursing at perceived enemies, and the blissful gurgling of the lobotomized, like a newborn babe discovering the sky. Hmm. I shall still find test subjects as surely as I find bloody sustenance in the night, but this climate, I fear, may never be replicated. Often I reflect with great regret on the missed opportunity that was my infector. Had I been conscious after the attack, I could have stopped the orderlies from locking her in the roaming pen. What I would give for just one interview, a few simple questions of the... ...the plague-ridden woman who met her end that dawn. Of course, there is no guarantee she would have been any more helpful than my current crop of test subjects, mewling wretches. Few could be called enthusiastic. Given the nature of the tests, I cannot expect the same fervor from all, but a modicum of cooperation would be appreciated. Animals. The one called John went so far as to gnaw off his arm and escape into the floorboards like some feral rodent. I still hear him scurrying about at night. He must be making an atrocious mess in there.
My studies proceed at a languid pace. I'm mired in a foul ennui as my wife's illness advances. My subjects grow restless without proper supervision, but I cannot pull myself back from this black depression. How many nights I've wasted now, gazing from the tower walk, pondering the frailty of existence. After decades of solitary study into this affliction, I have learned that it is by no means mine alone. Indeed, the city is home to an entire society of similarly afflicted individuals with whom I've only recently made contact. They are an understandably standoffish sort, by and large, but I have been able to confirm with them that the condition is indeed vampirism, which apparently comes in a multitude of strains, each with a spectacular set of symptoms such as invisibility and even a sort of lycanthropy. Through numerous official interactions with the governing body of this secret society, I have concluded that their fundamental understanding of the vampiric condition is woefully lacking and mired in suspicion and pseudo-religious dogma that would make a Turk balk for its strictures. Indeed, they seemed impressed with my studies and the eloquence with which I was able to present them. Apparently, the typical sufferer of my particular strain of vampirism is far from the vanguard of the King's English. So impressed were they that they even offered me an office in their government, a rather high office by the sound of things, I believe I shall accept. If nothing else, it should provide a lofty vantage point from which to observe the breadth and epidemiology of the affliction so that I may move more expeditiously toward a cure. I have accepted the role of Primogen for Clan Malkavian, the dreadfully winsome label applied to the particular strain of vampirism I suffer. 
so named for some supposed vampire father figure of old, or poppycock grown from a backward culture that seems interminably drawn to children's tales and the fiction of Victorian romance when it should concern itself with the science behind their suffering. No matter, for I have taken this office for no greater reason than to advance my research. I must make mention, however, that even among my would-be peers in this governing body of vampires, the level of paranoia and superstition is frightening. Their intelligence is not the question, no, indeed. As they courted me for this appointment, I had to suspect that their overtures were hand-tailored to what must be my obvious infatuation with reason, for the devil would do well to have such honey-tongued tempters. Even so, I could not help but notice the dressing of language these vampire leaders chose for their siren song. Whether it is born of habit, from addressing their unwashed, ill-educated subjects, or from their own deep-seated beliefs, their linguistic flourishes belie a faith in superstition over the providence of empirical reason that must be an all-pervasive theme in this society of darkest night. Damn it all, now I'm doing it too. As I expand my dealings with the vampire government, I have encountered a disturbing new symptom of this affliction. Frequently, in conversation, I will hear voices emanating from other vampires, voices that are not their own, but which seem to have insight into their lives beyond what I could gather from simple conversation. 
These voices seem to echo from deep within my fellow vampires, and I cannot be certain if this symptom belongs to my strain of illness or theirs. For the voices are various and inconsistent. I dare not mention this symptom to my vampiric peers, for they have proven themselves true predators to whom I could be loath to reveal any sign of weakness. Indeed, these voices have counseled me against confessing their presence, and until I can confirm their source, I will listen. The information the voices have given me ranges from curious to frightening. The latter case is especially true of one powerful vampire whose name I shall not commit to recording in the interests of self-preservation.
The voices have increased in frequency and direction of late. They have begun to stay with me long after conversation has ceased and are serving as quite a distraction. I fear others are beginning to notice my preoccupation at the vampire gatherings. I am thinking again of the particular vampire of whom I spoke previously, who I dare not name for my growing fear. If the voices are to be believed, then my caution is warranted, for they speak of his blackest crimes, both past and future. More than once I have seen the suspicion in his eyes and heard the distrust in his voice when speaking with me. The fear must register on my face, as it is all I can do in these moments to keep from crying out in chorus with the voices. I am no longer safe. I know it. The voices have proven themselves authentic, and I have withdrawn from the vampire society entirely. My absence will no doubt draw attention, but I could no longer hold my fragile composure around the ravenous eyes of my vampire peers, especially not around him. The voices compelled me to make what I fear is a Faustian bargain, but I had to, for their demands are constant and merciless. I have secluded myself within the mansion. I know he will strike out at me. He will go to any length to achieve his ambitions, and he knows it, I know. I have taken precautions to protect my beloved wife. Her cure will have to wait until our immediate safety is guaranteed. The mansion was constructed with security in mind, but at that time I was not privy to the full range of vampire capabilities. The voices echo in the twisted corridors of my psyche, dark whisperings of a macabre and formless menace, the approach of which portends an end, an end to all of this. is dead? Pity it could not be by my hand. No matter. Soon your self-made kings and false prophets and all who bear the mark of the beast will be washed from the earth for the coming of the Lord. 
Yes, you burn. Tell them it was Greenfeld Bach who sent your damned souls to that lake of fire. All agents of Satan shall return to whence they came. Let this righteous display serve as a promise to all who serve the Archfiend Lacroix. I'm coming for you, Lacroix. By the power of the Lord, I will cleanse your black soul. Is that? Babble your native. Yes, you burn. Let this. Evening there. Something burning? Ooh, smells like someone burnt the burgers. Ah, uh, sure, I'll open her up for you. Ah, jeez, I could go for one of them double-spaced burgers with the onions and the cheese and some bacon and a guacamole. Ooh. The Primogens still haven't been contacted by Grout. I thought I made it clear that you are not supposed to come back until we had heard from him. Grout's dead. What? Bach! Every time I think he's lost the scent. So, Bach killed Grout to draw me out. Bach is a hunter. 
They stalk and kill our kind to appease their god. But like many mortals, their so-called faith is nothing but a conduit through which they quench their killing urge. Who else would have killed Grout? Look at me. Are you sure it was Nines Rodriguez? Because if it was, the consequences... Do you know where this might lead? Do you really have any idea? Don't speak, don't act, don't presume ever on my behalf. You haven't the slightest sense of my accountability. It means... Under most circumstances, I would call a blood hunt on the murderer immediately. However, the Anarchs of this city may interpret such an action to be a declaration of war. I do not want a war with them. This decision will take some time. I need to confer with the Primogen on this. In the meantime, I've come to a decision on the Ankaran sarcophagus, and I believe that for the safety of the inhabitants of this city, we need to place the sarcophagus under Camarilla protection until its contents can be confirmed. This also is very important, so I need to call upon your skill once more. The Ankaran sarcophagus was quietly delivered to the Museum of Natural History a few hours ago. I would like you to bring it back here for safekeeping. The manifest from the Dane shows there was a small box from the same dig on board, but it was listed as missing. Keep an eye open for it. It may have been overlooked. It's crucial we get the sarcophagus in our possession within the next few hours. Here, I'm feeling charitable. Here are the keys to the front door of the museum. The sarcophagus should be in an examination room of some sort. There's a small security staff on site, but I don't want a massacre. Mortals are just as easy to deceive as they are to kill. There is a degree of immediacy attached to this task. Work fast. And, as on the Dane, you are not to open the Ankaran sarcophagus for any reason. Excuse me. Where to?
Hey, stop right there.
Hey, who's there?
Freeze! I can't understand why someone would go through the trouble of stealing a box with a very ancient corpse. This city's not that dull. I'm an archaeologist, so I thought I'd indulge in a quick study of this Ankaran sarcophagus everyone's so riled up about. My guess, from what I've read about it, is that it's a mummified Mesopotamian king. I needed confirmation. Since it's missing, I'm inclined to believe it was stolen, or intentionally misplaced, if you like. Clearly, though, it's not here. If I stole it, I would know where it was, and most likely wouldn't be looking for it here. Hmm, interesting choice of words. Weren't you here to take it away? Wouldn't that make you an attempted thief? If I stole it, I would know where it was, and most likely wouldn't be looking for it here. Oh, I really wish I had. All this speculation about the sarcophagus containing an antediluvian and being a portent of Gehenna is making me cringe. These are the kinds of ridiculous, superstitious assumptions I came here to debunk. Armageddon, Doomsday, the end of all kindred. It's a common facet of most mythologies. Fear that the world will end. Many believe Cain and the Antediluvians will return to consume or destroy all kindred. I wholeheartedly disagree. What prophecy doesn't have vague, apocryphal signs? Let's see. The usual ones cited are the appearance of thin bloods, cane sightings, doom, gloom, that route. Thin bloods rarely exhibit features or powers of their clan, and many can't embrace. Some are even rumored to have reproduced. Many kindred are terrified that their weak blood heralds the dissipation of every bloodline. Somewhat of an ignorant reactionary response, don't you think? As I said, many cultures have the fear of some form of apocalypse. Kindred believed in these stories when they were human, and naturally carried them over into kindred myth. 
But it doesn't take a supernatural act to cause widespread destruction. Humans and kindred are just as capable of managing their own destruction as a deity. A self-realized Gehenna warrants more vigilance than a god-induced one, don't you agree? Such is my argument, which so frequently falls on deaf ears. Cain is the biblical first kindred and founder of the mythological first city, Enoch, a place where kindred and kind coexisted. I believe Cain's a figure concocted to personify the transition from nomadic society to agrarian society. That myth, like most, has been twisted by time. Oh, don't let me interrupt your progress. If indeed you've made some, my reason for being here is probably being bid on as we speak. Someone is certainly going to be surprised when they find out they've just paid a kingly sum for a desiccated old corpse. Need a ride? Excuse me, uh, starting to doze off there. Oh, I need to get a guard animal of some sort to alert me when folks come in. Hmm, maybe one of them chimps like on that show Ape Detective? <laughs> oh, that, that monkey always gets his man. What? Oh, yeah, uh, Mr. LaCroix is expecting you. For a young guy, he, he sure likes to work late. Me, I spent most of my youth in the entertainment industry. Yeah, I guarded the sets for over six top ten TV shows. The folly of leadership is knowing that no matter what you do, behind your back there's hundreds, certain that their own solution is the sounder one, and that your decision was the byproduct of a whimsical dart toss. I pronounce the blast sentence, and I soak the critical fallout. I make the decisions no one else will. Leadership. I wear the albatross and a bullseye. The blood hunt on Nines Rodriguez for the murder of Alistair Grout will be called. Rodriguez's execution is only a matter of time. I have lit the fuse. If a war ignites, it's my head they will sharpen the pikes for. Now to the matter of the sarcophagus. Do you need assistance bringing it up? Stolen? Stolen? How? Who would... Oh. Gary. Gary, you treasonous maggot. I should have anticipated your treachery, sewer rat. The Nosferatu primogen. The Nosferatu were responsible for finding out where the sarcophagus was taken after the Dane, and for getting keys to the museum. They were the only ones who knew. It's obvious to me now, my mistake. I want him found. I want him... found. The sarcophagus could be... exploited. Causing who knows what catastrophe to this city. If it were to fall into the wrong hands... The Nosferatu lurk in the filth below the streets of Hollywood. But not even I know just where they hide. Hollywood is... Unfortunately, lacking in any Camarilla loyalties. Hollywood's Baron is an Anarch named Isaac. Isaac's more civil than the Anarchs downtown, but... 
Nonetheless, he wears his mistrust of me on his sleeve. He may know how to contact the Nosferatu. Find Gary and get him to talk. That sarcophagus could be used against us. Do not come back until you have it. Now, I must announce the blood hunt and bear the brunt of all consequences. Escort him out. <laughs> <laughs>